because it's an anniversary celebration, but it's also going to be a conversation, a conversation with you, and I'll make sure that we have a real dialogue with our speakers. But first of all, to open the session, the European Chairman, Mr. Reynolds. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Welcome to our 20th anniversary birthday party. I hope you've all got your party bags. Good, because that's it. <laughs> well, Europen was born 20 years ago <clears throat> with a group of companies that recognised their environmental responsibilities particularly in relation to packaging and the environment and relation to packaging waste, of course. These companies were willing to engage with developing public policy as the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive was being drafted by the Commission and the scene was set for some significant achievements by industry and by the policy makers that we'll hear about shortly this afternoon. Now here we are 20 years later, considering revisions for the directive that will apply for many years to come, and so the work of Europen will go on. Now on behalf of Europen, its members and staff, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all our guests today, including those from the Commission, the Parliament, the Council, permanent representatives, government ministries, NGOs, and industry trade associations and other key stakeholders. I'm also very pleased to welcome five former chairs of Europen. Now, I don't want to embarrass anybody, so in strictly alphabetical order, <laughs> we have Klaus Dreger. It's somewhere, yes, hi Klaus, welcome, thank you. We have the man who invented the name of Europen. Mr. Eric Johnson. <laughs> Harry Yong and Elan. Welcome. Anders Linda. And John Swift. I'd also very much like to welcome Julian Carroll, who was the managing director of Europen for most of these past 20 years. He was widely respected by all of our members in Europen and by the knowledgeable packaging world, not just in Europe, but also wider. Welcome, Julian. <clears throat> so just for two minutes, briefly, let us remember something about the last 20 years. Firstly, some of you in the room may not remember how Europe used to be when each country was free to have its own individual packaging rules and regulations. So one specific policy objective of the directive was to facilitate the free movement of packaged goods in Europe. Its internal market legal base, with the requirement that member states notify their draft regulations before implementation, has in a few dozen cases proved invaluable in safeguarding that policy objective and it remains just as relevant today. Now, the other policy objective, environmental improvement, is expressed through the essential requirements and the recycling and recovery targets for packaging materials. And it's this policy area that we will focus on during today's discussions. The packaging directive has proved to be a useful and a successful tool in increasing recovery and recycling, and has succeeded in relative decoupling of packaging waste from economic growth. But more than that has happened in the last 20 years. Let's just have a look at some of them. <clears throat> Both policy and individual company ambitions have developed. European members have, for example, published their own sustainability reports, and you can find a link to those on European's website. And they have had over the years applied their exp expertise in European working groups to, for example, the Waste Framework Directive Revision, Sustainable Consumption and Production Action Plans, 
life cycle assessments and everything that goes with that whole topic. The Global Protocol for Packaging and Sustainability, which is a fantastic piece of work. The role of packaging in preventing food waste. And of course, guidance on implementation and enforcement of the essential requirements. So with all of that, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members for their ongoing dedication and provision of expertise in the various committees, working groups and task forces. And I extend my thanks also to the Central European staff, who I think do a fantastic job, and to European's advisers, some of whom are here in the room today. <clears throat> now, let's move to the exciting developments of the immediate and future term that we have now before us. And I'm sure these things are going to keep us all busy and well engaged. So right now, right up in front of us, requiring our immediate attention, we have the revision of the packaging directive, including targets, the overall fitness check, and we also have the roadmap to a resource efficient Europe. So I'm delighted as we now enter our second period of 20 years to have Virginia Janssens at the helm as European Managing Director who's going to steer European through all these immediate and longer term developments. Now, understanding of some number of key issues is progressing and maturing amongst our stakeholders. Packaging, I think, is no longer just regarded as waste. It is a bit more than that. And people are beginning to understand that packaging plays an important role in providing citizens with the products they need, the food and drink that they need in a society which is increasingly urbanised. In fact, we here in Europe, just about 70%, 68% of the population of Europe now live in an in a urban environment. But still, nevertheless, many of the functions of packaging are still unclear to consumers as the product travels along the supply chain. But it becomes very visible when the product is separated from its pack for consumption or for use, and the packaging is left for final disposal. But as, Euro as Virginia says, the packaging supply chain as represented here in European is using less and less material to get products to the consumer in good condition. In the context of overall sustainability, packaging should be regarded as part of the solution and as a net contributor to achieving the broad sustainability goals of resource optimization and waste minimization. In other words, use as little as possible, but as much as necessary. Further, it is becoming accepted that packaging materials after first use are a valuable resource that can be used again to form more packaging or other useful materials and products and even energy recovery. And the 2020 objectives of the Commission towards a more resource efficient Europe are directly relevant for packaging. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now hear from Commissioner for the Environment, Mr. Yanis Potocznik, who will open for us the panel discussion. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving me the opportunity to open this event. First, let me congratulate European on its 20th anniversary and très bon anniversaire. From the outset, European has had a prominent role in helping shape the operation and further development of the European Union Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive. I highly appreciate European's efforts to bring together and motivate the entire packaging supply chain and help it to continuously improve its performance, to deliver better packaging solutions, and to minimize its environmental footprint across the whole life cycle of packaging. Over recent decades, much has been achieved in this respect, but as always, challenges persist and new opportunities are waiting to be seized. Within one generation, we will share the planet with 9 billion people. By 2030, 3 billion people will have moved out of poverty to middle-class consumer lifestyles. This global economic advancement is great news, but it will have a direct effect on the global extraction of resources, which is expected to increase by 75% in the next 25 years. Already today, 
Growing global demand is putting pressure on resources, such as materials, land and energy. Their prices are rising fast, supplies are less certain, and competition for resources between companies and between countries is growing. For Europe, a continent relatively poor in energy and materials, closing our eyes to these trends will have major negative economic and environmental consequences. We have no choice but to address them. This is why the Commission has placed the efficient use of natural resources at the centre of its growth strategy. Our long-term objective is to move away from today's linear economy, where we mine, manufacture, use and throw away, towards a circular economy, where waste is pumped back into the production cycle again as raw materials. The relationship of good waste management to the circular economy will be my central theme for next year. We will be creating a big debate on those subjects through our Let's Clean Up Europe Day on the 10th of May and in our annual Green Week in June. And the debate will be based around the review of our waste policy and targets. The seventh Environment Action Programme agreed by Member States and the European Parliament in June sets out a number of concrete waste-related proposals and objectives to be achieved by 2020. To reduce the amount of waste generated, to maximize recycling and reuse, to limit incineration to non-recyclable materials and to dramatically reduce landfilling. These objectives will guide our work as we review European Union waste policy and targets next year, including those in the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive. That directive will also be one of the five mature waste streams directives that we will look at in a regulatory fitness check to see if they remain fit for the purpose. But let me briefly turn to the role that packaging and packaging supply chain plays and can play in this context. It is clear that modern economies need packaging, and indeed it is clear that packaging can have a direct positive effect on resource efficiency. For instance, by preventing the loss of food on the way to shops, on the shelves and on the way to our kitchens. In terms of waste prevention, the past 10 years have seen a decoupling of the amount of packaging waste and economic growth, even though we could say this is a relative decoupling as the total amount of packaging waste rising is still on the increase. But once that packaging material becomes waste, it is increasingly being channeled back into the economy either through the reuse, recycling or recovery. In this respect, the trends observed in the European Union over the past decade are truly encouraging. On the other hand, I hope you agree with me that we still face a number of challenges. We must recycle more household packaging. We must make extended producer responsibility schemes more cost effective and transparent. We must reduce the littering caused by packaging waste, including plastic bags. We must ensure the implementation and the enforcement of the essential requirements contained in the Packaging Directive. And we must improve the comparability of data and statistics across the European Union member states. We will be tackling these challenges in the review of European Union waste policy, building them into a logical and coherent approach to boosting Europe's resource efficiency. I hope I can count on Europe's continued active support in this process. I wish you a very inspiring and enjoyable celebration event. Thank you for your attention. So, we heard from the Commissioner himself, confirming quite a few of the points that Mr. Reynolds had made. And let's see in a few minutes, before we start the panel discussion, we'll have representatives of environmental organizations, we have an rep eminent representative of the European Council, we have industry representatives. Let's first hear just a little more from the European Commission on all of this. We all know how important the Commission is, is an engine within the uh, EU. And so let's ask Mr. Julius uh, uh, Langendorf, who uh, is with the European Commission, who is with us, and uh, he can go into some more detail on what the Commissioner has said. If you agree, why don't you take six minutes from the Rossum to go into some more detail on a few of the points that the Commissioner has made. Mr. Langendorf. Yes. Let's see if this is on. Yes. 
Um, so, hello everybody. Um, first of all, thanks very much uh, to European for the invitation. We're, of course, very pleased uh, to be here. Let me take uh, five or six minutes maybe to uh, elaborate just a little bit on what uh, Commissioner Potoshnik has just said. And I must say we were, uh, we were listening with great interest our, ourselves because we provided some input. But then you never know how it comes out. And, um, <laughs> We are quite pleased with his uh, with his performance. I must say, he agreed with everything he said. Of course, we agree yes. with everything he said. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, let me just uh, spend a couple of minutes on what he referred to. That's the uh, target review uh, that is on the agenda for next year, and the fitness check, and that is part of our uh, EU waste uh, policy uh, review. And uh, the Commission just said that that is one of the major things on the, uh, the environment agenda in, 2000, in 2014. You all know that the, uh, to start with the, with the target review, that the packaging directive has targets for uh, recovery and recycling of, uh, of packaging waste. The main issue there, or maybe two main issues there, first of all, uh, we want to increase the ambition with respect to the, um, the recycling, uh, reuse, prevention of, of household waste, of municipal waste, including packaging waste. Uh, that's something that was said in the 6th to 7th um, Environment Action Programme, but what does it mean? Uh, and I think it's something that is shared by European reading from your position paper that in terms of industrial packaging, commercial packaging, a lot has been achieved. In terms of household packaging, more can be done and should be done. Um, so what we will try to do, but we will um, not do anything without a proper um, assessment of the impacts, is to increase the ambition in terms of uh, recycling of household packaging waste. So that's an important uh, objective of this, of this review. Um, the second thing with respect to the target review is, and it's also something briefly mentioned by the Commissioner, we know there is a big problem in terms of statistics, uh, data comparability across Europe, uh, so the statistics are only reliable to a certain extent. And this is partly related, but not entirely, partly related to the definitions of what recycling or recovery actually is. Um, that is something the packaging industry itself or the producer responsibility organizations are addressing. They have commissioned a study uh, to look at some of the data verification issues, and we are looking forward to receiving that study. It will be very important input. Just to give you one uh, specific example, if the mic is still on, of, of the issues we're looking at, uh, we have um, in the um, in the Waste Framework Directive, we have a definition of recycling and recovery, which is slightly different from the definitions in the older packaging directive. Uh, shouldn't these definitions be aligned? Uh, we still have in the packaging directive a maximum uh, for the uh, recycling of packaging waste. Shouldn't we remove that maximum? What is against removing that maximum? Uh, we have a separate recovery target. Does it still make sense if we're moving up uh, the uh, recycling target for uh, household packaging especially? Is it, does it make sense to still have um, a, a, a separate uh, recovery target? A number of questions that we will uh, look at. A few words on the fitness check. That's a separate exercise, but it's a different exercise part of the policy review. Uh, where we basically look back at a number of directives that have been in place for, say, 10, 15, in some cases, 20 years, the packaging directive uh, being one of them. Um, we will be looking at a number of issues there. Um, for example, uh, littering. Has the packaging directive done a good job in preventing littering? Have member states done a good job in, for example, through voluntary agreements with industry address the problem. Have EPR schemes um, included littering provisions? EPR schemes is the second thing we are looking at. Transparency, competition uh, aspects, 
uh, cost effectiveness of different schemes. And again, we have uh, had very fruitful dialogues with European over the past month. Um, and uh, on many things, I think there is an agreement that this is an important subject and also in terms of the subjects that we should look at. In terms of, of course, prevention and reuse will be part of the uh, fitness tech also. Is it true that uh, the reuse of packaging has gone down? Of course, reuse is higher up in the waste hierarchy than recycling and recovery. Is that something we can do something about? Uh, the overall um, amount of packaging arising, um, we've heard the commissioners say and um, uh, also the chairman say there is a uh, relative decoupling, but can we sustain that relative decoupling in the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, or are the gains that have been made in terms of lower weight uh, extremely difficult to sustain? Uh, and is it possible in some cases to actually have an absolute decoupling? These are some questions also. Uh, finally, maybe to mention briefly, I think the Commissioner mentioned it also, you know that we are working on a proposal on plastic bags, which we hope will, uh, will see the light of day uh, still this year. Um, and that is, of course, especially important in the context of, of, the, um, of littering and marine littering, which is a problem that has attracted worldwide um, attention over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, Alex, I hope this gives you a little bit more It's a bit uh, of a details. start, and, uh, and we'll hear from the other members of the panel. Mr. Reynolds, a uh, happy man after what we've heard from the Commissioner and from Mr. Langendorf at this stage, very, very briefly, because we're going to have the panels. As you said, I think it's a useful start, <laughs> and we'll see how we continue the discussion. Okay, so let's uh, invite Mr. De Paus, Peter De Paus, Policy Director with the European Environmental Bureau. If you please take up your seat. We already know, of course, Julius Langendorf, Deputy Head of Unit with DG Environment at the European Commission. We're very privileged to have Roberta Di Lecce, who is Environment Attaché with the Italian Permanent uh, Representation here to the EU in Brussels. Uh, benvenuta Sabina Stranad, uh, Director of Resource Recovery with uh, Coca-Cola Hellenic. And of course, Coca-Cola Hellenic sounds very Greek, but it's a lot more than Greece. It's, uh, it's what, 24 countries? It's almost 40,000 people. It's one of the biggest uh, uh, bottling uh, uh, companies in the world within the Coca-Cola group. And uh, we're also going to hear from Louis Lindenberg, uh, Global Packaging Director of Sustainability with Unilever. Very much a man of design for a long time, but now is so busy with his program in uh, packaging uh, uh, sustainability that you no longer have time for the design, but it was your passion, wasn't it? You now with equal passion. And, okay, Mr. De Paus, after what we've heard from the Commissioner, uh, apparently industry is doing quite a few things right would you agree with that? I, I couldn't help noticing that you were looking at uh, the present in your bag in the front row, and you looked at the packaging of your present, and you looked quite happy. Um, yes, I, I, um, I looked at the packaging, obviously, to, to see if I could somehow bring that into my, uh, my intervention. And, and, and I think compared to a lot of the uh, presents given, I mean, it's quite unusual to give a present at your birthday. Normally, you get presence but thank you very much for the present and the invitation of course okay um, it is actually quite good a glass you can reuse a cardboard simple material um, <clears throat> packaging so um, I think I think um, of course industry is doing well but uh, the reason they have been doing well in the past has been of course also a consequence of the fact we have had a packaging directive that's been uh, steering a lot of those developments and, of course, the Commissioner also said there are a couple of other things that can be done. You must have a list of desires. We'll hear about that in a minute. We've already heard from uh, Mr. Langendorf uh, in his introduction, so let's immediately move on to Roberta Di Lecce for a first intervention. Um, we know that uh, Italy is going to be uh, in the chair in the Council when the review uh, comes up there. So we're looking at Italy here. and. Uh, Italy, in many ways, has been a driving force in all of this, hasn't it? 
Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I hope this, is, this one is working. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes, Italy indeed has played a role in all of this because our previous Minister of the Environment, Mr. Clini, and our current Minister of Environment are both members of the European Resource Efficiency Platform. And this is an issue that we've been uh, paying a lot of attention to because um, Italy has a tradition of efficiency. We are a country that has few resources. We are a country that has high energy prices. So as you can imagine, for us, environment makes a lot of business sense, among other things, because the more efficient we are, the more competitive we are. And uh, uh, we also um, tried to help as much as we could in bringing forth the seventh European Action Programme on the environment. We have tried to have the presidency and the commission get through with this important piece of legislation. Now. Uh, uh, we have heard what the Commission has announced for next year, so for now, the only thing that I, can, that I can say is that we will have a lot to do, and we look forward to see these proposals, we look forward to working on them, and we hope that we will be successful. Okay, thanks very much, and you're ready to do all the hard work. Sabine um, what we just heard from uh, Roberta Di Lecce, a lot of this makes good business sense, doesn't it? Uh, within your company, you're a driving force behind all of that. You have enormous experience uh, in many different countries uh, uh, at this stage. Something that you can tell all of the panel members that is being done today, sometimes even ahead of regulations. Sabine Srena. Yes, good afternoon. Um, yeah, we, seen, we are now in 28 countries and a lot of things happened due to the packaging directive. Uh, we have uh, started with the collection of packaging waste in all European countries, but as well in terms of prevention, as this was mentioned earlier. Um, for example, we have started already 2004 with uh, internal prevention targets to reduce the packaging uh, footprint by 25%, and that was with m several measures. Among them is uh, lighter packaging, it's uh, less group packaging so that we have a better logistics, but as well recycling content, um, different materials, and this is tracked. It's tracked uh, and it's even audited by external resources. So uh, I think we have uh, provided in this respect um, some, some good examples. Louise Lindenberg, how does Unilever do it? How do you get organized to achieve this resource efficiency that's very much at the heart of our panel discussion this afternoon? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll tell you, we've got to go back a few years. So about 15 years ago, Unilever started with the whole program of, of eco-efficiency in our plants and and we were looking at reducing waste, we were looking at uh, reducing water and um, energy within our plants. But it came to a point in time where we said, well, actually, we've got a responsibility across the entire value chain and not just within our own little gate-to-gate -gate area that we operate in. Um, so we, we did measurements and we measured from uh, cradle, so where our, our products are coming from, whether it's extraction or farming, and we measured all the way through to the end of life scenarios. And coming out of those measurements, we then set up ourselves various pillars that we were going to tackle, and uh, we set targets against those pillars. So I have the privilege of leading the waste area for the business under packaging sustainability. And there we said we're going to decouple our business growth from our environmental impact, and we're going to look at reducing our waste by 50% per consumer use. Now, you can imagine that uh, trying to do that, there's only a certain amount of packaging that you can reduce from your products before you start causing damage and uh, going through the value chain or reducing barrier and shelf life and all of those kind of things. So what we had to do to be able to offset that and to help us to progress is we developed a whole new team within Unilever um, that's focused on materials capability and they work outside of your traditional project time, which is about 18 to, to 24 months. So they're working on the long-term agenda of how can we find new materials? How can we develop new technologies and, and create new innovations? And yet, it, in 2010, when we launched the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, Paul stood up, Paul Pullman, and he said, 
we have set ourselves massive targets. We know about 50% of how to get there. The other 50% we have absolutely no idea, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, and that's what we're doing. We're using these groups and we're working through open innovation and we're inviting everybody. I, I do loads of keynotes around the world to engage people and to get them to come forward with ideas and to help us to really try and push this program. I can tell you in Europe, every single one of our plants that are in Europe now have zero waste to landfill, non-hazardous waste to landfill. So that we've already achieved and there's a global target pushing forward. Now for us, the big issue is the post-consumer, and that's where we're really pushing hard now. Mr. Langendorf, when uh, I heard uh, Mr. Lindenberg speak about measuring, measuring uh, I was reminded of what we heard from the Commissioner, who, by the way, is now in Japan attending an environmental conference, I think, on Mercury, isn't he? Um, he also mentioned in his um, opening address that data should become more comparable between member states. That is a, a major issue, isn't it? At yeah. present, they are not very often. No, it's, it's, it's an issue that I think industry itself recognizes it is an issue. Um, um, many of these things, um, I, I think, are uh, the, the more we can push a, a level playing field and the more we can push comparability of efforts and of data is a good thing and that's that applies to the EPR schemes and that's why I think uh, broadly Europe and supports the efforts that we're putting in to uh, improve the operation and design of those of those schemes but it also applies to, to data now there are a number of levels there there's the issue of definitions in the directives themselves and that will be addressed in the in the fitness check um, some of these definitions are interpreted in different ways by member states. And then is the, the issue of what kind of data do member states send to Eurostat? What are the methodologies that they apply? And there are different methodologies. And that is something Sometimes that... Sometimes there are real anomalies. Uh, and yes. then Eurostat may ask a question about it. Uh, but then it's not very clear what happens with the answers. It's, it's also not always very transparent, is it? Is, is that published, that kind of information? Well, I think that Eurostat has been transparent when they got complaints about some of the anomalies or things that seem strange. Uh, they, they replied, but they in turn rely on the information they get from, from member states, and if member states use different ways to gather or process these data, there is only so much that Eurostat can do. Uh, but again, the industry itself is, is working on the study and we've been in touch with them uh, several times uh, and we, we're looking forward to that study that should come out um, any day now, my understanding is. Eurostat has been involved um, and it's, it's very good input to the fitness tech that we're conducting because everybody realizes that here there's still a lot to be done. It might be mm -hmm. either in the legislation itself to some extent or... Um, in, in, in terms of guidance to member states on how to report, what data sources to use, what methodologies and so on. Mm. Mr. De Paus, uh, you, you also need figures to base your position on verification mm. of um, what, what is being uh, achieved, etc. But you can't measure everything, right? So this, uh, how do you see the role for different partners in that chain? That has been stressed a couple of times, how Europe manages to look at the whole of the chain. That is what the Commissioner seems to really appreciate. Um, in your wildest dreams, in the perfect world, where, where do we need to, uh, to move to make it even better? Um, we, we, we don't tell you about our wildest dreams on <laughs> panels like these. They're, they're way too scary for <laughs> We, we always come with very, very modest, simple uh, requests that we do think. Yeah. Um, Give I us mean, uh, three I, examples. I, yeah. I, I think, f f first of all, I mean, as NGOs, we're not in the business of gathering, crunching data numbers. Uh, we sometimes ask people to do it for us if we think the Commission is asking the wrong questions or doing the wrong things. But I think in, in this case, the Commission is asking the right questions, doing the right things. So we're uh, eagerly looking at what they're doing, what they're basing themselves on, will engage in the impact assessment. I think in terms of what we're expecting 
in a very modest way again, uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, is a number of things. I think, first of all, we do think it's very important that we start uh, proposing and having uh, prevention targets in this uh, new directive. Um, it's something that wasn't easy when we started with recycling targets many years ago, but look where we've come today, and we need to make that step now uh, for the prevention uh, targets as well and go in that direction. Um, secondly, we do need to look critically at how we can scale up the recycling targets. We uh, are favoring an approach where you would regularly increase at a predictable pace to um, increasingly higher level. Um, I, I, I've been looking at your position paper, by the way, while I was preparing. So <clears throat> one of the issues that comes up there, I think, then, is the essential requirements uh, as something to look at much more closely now. Um, our own experience as, as NGOs from across Europe has been that uh, the way that's been implemented hasn't worked that well, and we do need to become more prescriptive on that in order to make the recyclability, the reuse of packaging materials a, um, a lot easier. And uh, finally, on um, <clears throat> producer responsibility schemes, um, we agree about that needs to be harmonized. We do think it's essential that becomes a upward harmonization, of course, to the best performers we already have in Europe uh, today. So I think that's sort of in a nutshell how we Let's see what Look Mr. Lindeberg makes of all of that. Uh, we hear words like targets, like restrictive, blah, blah, blah. Mr. Lindeberg, is this the way to go? So I, I agree with um, the majority of it. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous when we start talking about preventative mm -hmm. um, because it's almost as if we, we're looking in a, in a microcosm at, at packaging itself and forgetting about the macro picture of product and packaging and the whole value chain. So a little bit nervous there. But what I think is um, that in general, really good progress has been made. I, I agree certainly with the statements that we need to increase recycling and recovery. I certainly um, agree with the Commission that uh, reporting needs to become um, much more harmonized, harmonized definitions and um, consistent across the, the union. And the reason why I say that is because myself and some of my colleagues from bigger corporates, um, some in, in the room, are starting to use that data to, to determine the programs that we're driving. So I look at the company and I say plastics in Europe has got X recycling rate, and I'm using that as a tool for my engineers to determine which materials they're going to select when they're designing a product. So they're starting to look at these kind of figures and say, well, if PET is at 50% and high density is only at 40%, i will go with the PET. So, you know, these are, these are the kind of tools that we're starting to implement now. And it comes to essential requirements as well. Um, I, I make a joke sometimes, and I say for big businesses, in, uh, waste reduction or sustainability is uh, another word for VRP, value, value Innovation Programs, because for years and years, companies have been reducing packaging all the time. And we've got to a point where we're using the optimal amount of packaging. Um, so now what, we, what we're looking at is the end-of-life solutions and how we can couple both of the reduction and the recycling and recovery to give the optimal product. Mm -hmm. This is uh, De Leche. Um, as we hear these big efforts being made to reach that optimum level uh, being reached in some cases, you think this is very important? We, the Commissioner already mentioned it in the fight against food waste. Yes, exactly. And uh, I don't want to feed the stereotype that Italians are all about food, but we actually, uh, we actually consider reducing food waste as one of the possible priorities during our semester. And we think that and it's enormous. It's one and a half billion tons a year exactly. uh, in per capita terms. Europe and America are the worst of them. 100 kilos a year of food wasted. And this is something that in the current crisis is becoming even politically unsustainable. Uh, we cannot 
let this happen purely and simply. And so we uh, we believe that this is a domain where we could work hand in hand with the, with the stakeholders, with the industry. And I'm here also to sound you out, if possible. And I don't know if I can ask permission to our moderator to ask a question myself. To? To my of fellow course, yes. Can I? this is a conversation. By the <laughs> way, you. each and every one of you, if you want to do it, give me a sign, I'll come with the microphone to you. So now, Mrs. Delech's question. <laughs> Just yes. a question. Okay, so you represent big businesses, and I've heard a lot about big businesses, but I represent a country where the bulk of the economy is made up by small and medium-sized enterprises. Is there any way that we can help them improve their performance, maybe drawing on your best practices, or are there any suggestions or programs of cooperation or something like that? Because this is something that I anticipate will come up during our semester because of the structure of our economy. Thank you. This is really a question for the chairman, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, lots of expertise there available and governments eager to uh, put it to good use. Thank you. <coughs> Well, I think, first of all, the, the subject of food waste is something that's important to everybody involved uh, in, in the chain compared with food and drinks companies. And uh, a lot of the, the solutions that are put in place are maybe developed primarily in the, in, the, um, in the larger companies through the types of work that Sabina was talking about earlier. But, but once they are available and they're publicly known, there's, uh, th th these, are, these are solutions that can be widely spread. So I see no issue at all in SMEs uh, actually doing the same sort of program. Okay, Sabina Stranad. Um, lots of companies interested in what you're doing right. Uh, no, as, as we, for example, we involve the whole supply chain in all our activities, and we have smaller suppliers, bigger suppliers, depending, and, and always we try to have local suppliers, so to really involve the local industry, small and medium industry. And all experience what we have, we also bring them into the associations. Uh, we work for example, in Italy with the Soft Drink Association and with other associations where, again, we bring in our experience. And in terms of recyclability, there is from the bottle platform uh, a standard how to make BT bottles more recyclable and what should be avoided in order to hinder recycling. And that is translated to Proda in all the countries and uh, is helping also smaller producers, local producers, to gain and build on that. And, of course, this conversation bringing a beautiful smile to the board from, uh, from industry. I mentioned the PR schemes, of course, uh, we have to look at some of the details, but overall there is a common recognition that there is scope for improving their operation and uh, that we want to cut cost, uh, be more transparent in some cases, address competition issues and so on. With respect to one of our ambitions, uh, ambitions to do more about uh, the recycling and reuse of household waste, municipal or household waste, um, that includes household packaging. I think there's also agreement from Europe and that it is a good thing uh, to uh, do something about the issue that I mentioned, reporting uh, different methodologies that member states apply in uh, calculating what household waste actually is. There is agreement. So if you look at all these things, we feel that there is a lot of support. Uh, if you turn to some of the more material uh, specific aspects, we talk to the glass industry, they tell us, please help us achieve more recycling and reuse of glass. Uh, that, of course, means a better separate collection. Uh, what can you please do about that? The plastic industry, we've had a conference, we had a conference 10 days ago. They themselves propose that the recycling of plastic can be dramatically increased. They suggest 62%. The European Parliament calls for 75%. We'll see where that uh, ends. Uh, there is broad support for a landfill ban on plastic. So on many of these things, uh, what we see is a support from industry to do more. Uh, waste is a valuable resource, is a secondary raw material, and uh, just putting it in a landfill, uh, but also in many cases just putting it in an incinerator is not, is not the way we should continue uh, working. So I think on many of these things we feel there is support for what we're doing, which of course doesn't mean that we agree on all the details. There are always things uh, that we will have to uh, discuss in more detail, but we do feel there is support for the broad 
the broad um, objectives that we try to push uh, forward. Thank you, uh, Mr. Langdorf. An intervention from the floor on this point, I think. Yes. And uh, we'll make it a habit. Most of us know each other, but uh, let's, let's stand up so that uh, the television cameras can grab. Teresa Presas. So, thank you very much. Well, first of all, can I take it? Just for your comfort, just for your comfort. It's easier. You can. Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations, European. I'm one of those who have been around for 20 years, maybe even more. I No, I don't look like it. Discussing targets a little bit more, a little bit less. You know, it's, it's on and on and on. Uh, and, you know, I just wonder how we can continue 20 more years with this discussion when we have no harmonized definitions of recycling. You said it yourself, Mr. Langendorf. Um, we have uh, legislation is not implemented everywhere. We have guidance documents that bring different interpretations to legislation. May I interrupt you yeah, briefly? I, I, this sound, no, 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 no. Can I ask you? I mean, you make it sound as if nothing has happened, nothing has been achieved. No, no, that's not you, what you were saying. You didn't let me do it. What I wanted to say is, in, in spite of all this, industry has done a lot. EPRs, because you don't know that, but EPR schemes were set up by industry. We have seen just a couple of examples here of improvements in the package sector. Can't policymakers and NGOs be a bit more creative and think of new enabling tools and mechanisms to support all this? Give them a couple of ideas. Give them a couple of days. Give, well, give them a couple of ideas. There's a lot of good ideas, good practices around that you know, should be enhanced instead of... Give us one example. One example. You heard them. Yep. You heard them. Okay. So it's not going badly. I'm from the paper industry, and I can give you lots of examples. We are world champion in recycling, okay, and in doing more with less as well. So I, you know, you just listen to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody uh, feeling like responding in any way, Mr. Langendorf? Yes. Of course. Uh, and, and thanks for uh, that first comment from the, uh, from, from the floor. Um, I, I think one of the things, at least that's the way we perceive it, one of the enabling things is, is actually moving the bar up and, and being more ambitious and say we can actually um, take the, the example of the glass industry. I had a very interesting conversation with the glass industry a couple of weeks ago. They say, well, we can, between you and me, do 80% of recycling of glass, if not more. The only problem is uh, that in some countries, separate collection of glass is not done properly, glass is contaminated, so we have a problem uh, recycling uh, glass and putting it back into the, uh, the, the, the loop. Um, if we are more serious about uh, recycling targets, but then also, of course, pushing member states to actually implement, and it's the second important strand of our work. It's not only about uh, coming up with new legislation uh, and making it better, but also making sure that we implement what we have. And I haven't talked about that uh, much, but there is a, a lot of work going on there also. Then that will eventually help industry because it means that member states will have to improve their uh, separate collection schemes. If they have to do more recycling, there is only one thing that you can do, that is improve your separate collection schemes. It also means that uh, industry may have to improve uh, the recyclability of its products. So we think that if we give this push, uh, and it will not happen overnight, it will be, uh, as I said before, it will be based on a very thorough analysis. Um, we will look at the timelines, uh, any increased, uh, say, recycling targets for plastics or for metals or for paper or for what have you uh, will uh, will be phased in over time uh, we will have we're working on a rather sophisticated model to look at the the feasibility of it of the costs and the benefits of it that will be part of our impact assessment um, so i think that is in itself an enabling factor of course there may be many more but uh, just saying we can do more um, and we will ask member states to do more, will also help industry in the end. That's our, that's our conviction. 
Thank you very much. Your call for more creativity, clearly heard very well. You look satisfied with an answer? Not really, no? Okay, let's have a, a very brief follow-up. No, not really. Okay, we have another intervention from the floor here. Yes. Congratulations, European. Uh, next year, FOS Plus will celebrate its 20th anniversary, so you will be all very welcome then. And you will all receive a present too, so don't bring presents for us. Uh, my question to me goes in, in principle to Mr. Langendorf, but also the other uh, participants in uh, the panel. Uh, EPR exists more or less for 20 years. Uh, we have EPR schemes in all countries. Uh, industry is taking the initiative, and I fully agree with the intervention of uh, Teresa. Uh, but, uh, a little bit more, uh, let's say, challenging than, uh, okay, or more or less challenging. Uh, why in, let's say, 50% of the countries, we see performance, we see efficiency, we see effectiveness, and in the other 50% 50, 50 we don't see it at all. We have really low performance. The European Commission is, during few years now, studying EPR, having now also a close loop at reviewing the targets. But do you have in the meantime any idea why some are performant and others aren't at all? Okay, we'll ask the question to the Commission. But generally, when someone asks a question like that, he has some idea about the answer. Would you mind sharing a bit of your own answer to your own question at this stage, or shall we wait for the Commission to speak first? Yes, let's wait for the Commission first. Mr. Langendorf, a question for you again. Um, it's basically about uh, EPR and level playing field, isn't it? Um, widely divergent realities out there in different member states. You want these things to work, right? How make sure that they do work on the basis of fairness and a level playing field. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's precisely one of the objectives of, the, of, the, uh, of, of the, our efforts. And it's not so that we've been studying on this for years and years. It's a subject that we described uh, in a study that we released uh, early uh, last year. And there's now a follow-up study, and I think many of you are, are involved. What we tried to do is work out a number of, and again, in, in, in close contact with industry, of, of recommendations, golden rules, as they're sometimes called, to make um, EPR schemes more effective, but also more cost-effective, because what we see is that many schemes can be effective, but at very different costs. So you see that in some countries, uh, the industry pays much more uh, than in another country, but for the same results. So why is that? What explains that? That is very closely linked to the issue of transparency. How much do you pay in? Um, what do you get for your money? Where does the money uh, go? That's an important thing. Um, so it's clearly a subject that is very high on, the, uh, on, our, on our agenda. Uh, we hope to have the study ready by the end of this, uh, this year. Uh, and we will then have to see to what extent we can either put some of the conclusions into the, um, the uh, proposals for uh, uh, revision of the directive, so in, in, the, in the form of legislative proposals, or in the form of guidance to member states' recommendations. That is still a subject that is a bit open, but it's clearly something we're working on very uh, very intensively, um, and again, in close, uh, in close cooperation with many of, uh, of you. Um, it is, and that's a more broader question, it is a fact that the implementation of waste legislation across Europe uh, is, is, uh, is, is going in different paces, uh, especially the new member states that have been members for, say, 10 years, have a huge challenge there, but we see that some of them are catching up. Uh, others have more difficulties, so we're working extremely hard also with those countries, giving them recommendations, uh, trying to see how we can use structural funds money to improve recycling facilities, structural uh, separate collection uh, and things like that. Uh, but that, of course, remains a challenge. You cannot expect countries like Bulgaria, Romania, uh, to do work uh, that uh, other member states had 20 years to do in, 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 uh, in, in five or six years. 
Um, so there is there is clearly an issue of of um, countries having more difficulties reaching the targets for the packaging targets. By the way, I think that most member states, with some exceptions, have achieved the recycling and recovery targets for 2008. So on that trend, uh, we have a little bit of less uh, a little bit less concerns. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. The pause on uh, EPR. Yeah, I think because, because in the previous question, NGOs were in a way also addressed, and <clears throat> there's always a risk that when there's a commission on the panel, all the questions go to the commission. So I just want to come come in on some of these issues about, you know, the policy is not perfect. Uh, let, let's first move on with implementation. I think that's a bit of a, a strange discussion in the end, whether because companies are not perfect either. Um, and, and I think um, what you need to keep in mind is that I think as an NGO person, as a, as a consumer, it's, it's all very well to hear the stories about what, what are companies doing, what are the efforts they've made, but the question is how does that all add up? Um, there is an environmental imperative as well for doing all these things. Um, there may be an optimal efficiency level that makes sense to an individual company which may, completely, may be completely inadequate to solving a societal problem like reducing carbon emissions, reducing pressures on ecosystems. So you do need a bit more than just hearing the good stories about what companies are doing. Of course, if there are, that in, in the case that there are good examples, I think there are quite a lot of NGOs who are actually um, active in that field to engage, make partnerships with, with companies such as WF does with Coca-Cola, for example. I mean, these, these things do happen, of course. Uh, as, as EB, I don't think we're sort of PR, have a high enough PR profile to be interested for, interesting for that. But I mean, that, that is something that, of course, uh, does happen. But uh, if, if you look at, <clears throat> at the implementation, I mean, this is a general problem across the board. It doesn't apply only to waste policy. It applies to all our environmental policies. It applies to a lot of other policies, including to our own uh, monetary policies and, 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 and the whole problems we're having in the Eurozone. And there's a very interesting overlap between those countries who are having difficulties um, meeting Eurozone requirements and those meeting environmental problems. We're it's not going to, to start discussing monetary policy. We're going to stick to uh, yeah. packaging and packaging waste. But my, my, my point is there's a yeah. bigger problem there. You don't, don't require the packaging, waste packaging policy to resolve that one. Okay. Yes. Um, <coughs> we have another intervention from the floor. Yes. Hello, my, my name is Monica Mireles and I work in sustainability for IKEA. And I wanted to react a bit of what Mrs. Leche uh, mentioned about the, how do we help actually the, the smaller enterprises and actually touching in two points that for us are actually hindering the circular economy. And one is the administrative burdens and the second one is actually the infrastructure. So the reason why we have, well, anecdotally, Italy is one of the countries where we face the most trouble to get our recycling done. And that's basically because we don't have a local recycle that they can do over plastic recycling. We have these loading ledges where we have uh, plastic to be granulated and then fixed again into a, a structure that holds the pallet, basically. And um, we can't do it in Italy. Uh, this uh, plastic needs to be transported to Austria. Um, and if we want to do that to get the material back in the loop, then we will need to face the permits for transport, the permits for storage that you understand it's quite lengthy and quite time consuming for us to actually do it. So at the same time, um, we want to continue doing these things, but they are really small uh, administrative boards and that are kind of stopping us from doing that. And yesterday I got a call actually from one of my colleagues working on the packaging um, saying, well, we, it's true, we have done doing the optimal packaging. And the problem, if we want to reduce it more, there's something that nobody has really think about, thought about it, and it's about the labels. Like we have so many labels to put in the packaging that if we reduce it more, we can't put the labels anymore. So how do we, are we actually thinking about these issues when we are talking about the targets as well? Thank you. Okay, and thank you for putting us with our feet on the ground, a real concrete situation. This is the kind of challenges you're facing every single day as well, Sabine Estranad, uh, these concrete, how do you make all of these overall objectives work in concrete yeah. terms? And of course, maybe Roberta Di Lecce will want to say something on uh, situations in different member states, maybe also in Italy. We'll see that in a minute. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, so we are also operational in Italy, and I agree sometimes Italy might be a little bit difficult, but I have to say we have got no problem with recycling all our plant waste, and we are also meeting zero waste to landfill. So in this respect, that, that was not an issue. Um, and this is applicable all over, all over the countries. And uh, we have to be transparent and it needs to be uh, clear and it can be also checked. And it is checked versus third parties. So it's not only a good branding story. <coughs> it is something which is real happening. And there is one pure reason why it is so strongly implemented. And that is cost saving. Because whatever we do in terms of prevention in, in reducing packaging through the whole value chain is reducing, on the one hand, a cost factor, on the other hand, a CO2 footprint, which is indirectly a cost factor. So in this respect, there is a pure interest of all industry and all companies to do this uh, actively and follow up on a regular basis. Roberta Di Lecce. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, I didn't know that this was going to be a seminar about the situation in Italy. <laughs> so, I didn't, Just one example. I didn't yeah. prepare myself to uh, respond directly to this question. So, and I'm not going to talk about any other member state either. But I want to make a general remark, which is that sometimes uh, we can have um, a, the very best intentions and uh, a very good uh, waste legislation. But uh, it is a reality of life that in many, many member states, the division of competences over the various authorities that deal with the different aspects, the, such as uh, special planning, managing of the territory, uh, and, and other and infrastructure building and other uh, related aspects are split among several actors. And to carry out a coordination of all of these actors is absolutely a challenge. And this is not only in Italy. I think this happens in many parts of Europe. So uh, the only way to get through this, since it is not possible to change the division of labor among state authorities just for this, is to carry on with a better coordination, an improved coordination, and to try and have everyone on board. OK. Anybody else on uh, this issue that was raised before we have? Yes. Mr. Langender. Just on the, on the SME issue, because that's, that's something that many people have, have mentioned. Um, th there has been, and I don't know to what extent people um, are aware of it, but there has been a, an exercise going on uh, last year uh, where SMEs could tell us in the Commission what are, uh, what are your uh, uh, most hated directives in terms of administrative burdens uh, across, not environment, but across the entire uh, policies of the Commission. Um, and uh, that was called the top 10 exercise. So there was a list coming out of the top uh, 10 uh, most um, irritants in a way. Uh, some of them were actually related to waste. And we took that extremely seriously. We read the, the comments. The Commission responded uh, with a communication saying, OK, uh, this directive, these are comments. We're doing something about this. Uh, um, we felt that the comments we received from SME organizations, uh, Business Europe, but also national um, organizations, were uh, not always very clear. So it was difficult for us. Uh, to know whether this was a case of national implementation, gold plating, or administrative burdens imposed by national uh, authorities, or it was actually something in the directive itself that could be uh, removed without jeopardizing the environmental objectives. Uh, to cut a very long story short, what we intend to do is to really follow up on that, organize a workshop with the uh, SMEs that made comments and possibly also others, and see in those uh, pieces of waste legislation uh, that were mentioned to see what it is that we can what it is that we can do uh, what it is that we can do at our level and we hope to do that in the course of uh, the spring 2014 it requires a bit of preparation uh, to get SMEs in and to really talk some of to, to through some of these issues to see what it is uh, in terms of ministry of burdens reporting uh, whatever requirements
It's of course also part of the fitness tech that I talked about. Are there obsolete provisions that can be removed? Uh, are there things that make life uh, of SMEs extremely difficult? And then we're happy to talk about that. So it's something that is on our agenda and um, that we will, uh, uh, we will look into uh, in more detail. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, very briefly, Mr. Lindenberg, and then we have three interventions. Okay. okay, Mr. Lindenberg. Uh, so just quickly, coming back to the topic about big corporates and, and the work that they're doing and sharing with, with small companies and things. I was part of the group that developed the Global Packaging Protocol. Um, and that was done through a whole lot of big corporates getting together and sitting down, putting a lot of resource behind it and finding a common definition, common methodology of doing measurement uh, a, a common way of speaking to each other within the industry, all the things we're asking for now. And then we put that out to everybody globally and said, this is what we've agreed on, this is what we're working for, anybody can subscribe to it and use it. And I think that's the way we're progressing in the future. I'm involved in a lot of projects in, in different areas in waste management and, and recycling and recovery around the globe. And more and more of us are, are talking to each other and, and trying to find ways of, of defining things and taking them forward. So it'll come. It's a slower pace, but that was the bench set of the global packaging protocol, and more of this will come. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, you've been very patient for quite a while. Yes, Jane, work yourself. Hi, I'm Jane Vickerstaff from InkPen, and I'm afraid I remember the birth pangs of the birth of, Ink, of Europen. But after 20 years, the memories are fading. I wanted to make two points just on waste prevention, because when you look at the use of packaging, it actually protects more than 10 times the resources in the product itself. And therefore, it is by its own nature a waste prevention measure. Coupled with that, the economy in the last 20 years in Europe has, has been booming. It has slowed down now, which means that fewer products are being bought, which in turn means there'll be less packaging on the market because the product and the packaging are inextricably linked. So is it necessary or even feasible to have any additional measures or even targets on waste prevention? Mr. Langen, the, the fundamental question. <laughs> Is it even necessary? <laughs> it's also part of what you just mentioned. Uh, regulations, you know, fitness tests. Well, two weeks ago, I think the Stoiberg Committee concluded that already the number of uh, regulations had gone down considerably, and he was happy with that. This fundamental response, something that comes from the heart of someone who has spent many years working to achieve the objectives. And wouldn't you agree that uh, uh, this 20-year-old adult looks in top shape, European, <laughs> your proud mother? I'm a grandmother, I'm afraid. I'm very proud. <laughs> okay, Mr. Langdorf. Okay, prevention. So you, you all know that prevention is on, on top of the waste uh, hierarchy. Uh, we have this hierarchy, prevention, reuse, recycling, uh, recovery with energy, uh, or energy recovery and disposal as the most, uh, the, the less preferred, least preferred option. Um, the, if you look at the seventh environment action program, and Commissioner mentioned it, uh, mentioned it uh, briefly, uh, it it picks up on uh, waste prevention as the most important thing to do. That means try to um, not only uh, achieve absolute discoupling. This absolute discoupling applies to waste generation in, in general, not packaging waste uh, specifically. Um, um, and that is the most important thing. Now, how do we translate that broad objective into legislation is a question we are grappling with. Member states are um, supposed to come forward with their own waste prevention programs, and we'll see uh, those in the course, I believe, of next year. So member states are working on waste prevention programs. So the question could be asked, uh, in the work, the waste framework directive, the most important piece of our waste legislation, whether it would not be a bit premature to uh, insert waste prevention targets now that member states are still working on their waste prevention uh, programs. Um, so the question of prevention targets specifically is on the table. Um, 
what exactly the approach is that we will be taking there is, is difficult to say. The second thing is, is reuse. Um, that's an important thing also. What we see in the Waste Framework Directive is that we have a, a target for reuse and recycling of municipal waste. In the uh, Packaging Directive, reuse is not mentioned as part of a target, it's recovery and recycling. So there again, there is some kind of an inconsistency. Why can't reuse count against recycling targets, against the overall target? Um, and from what I understand is that the reuse of packaging has actually gone down a bit over the past years. Uh, is there something we can do to, um, to promote further reuse while, of course, keeping in mind the internal market problems that in some cases may arise? Um, okay, Peter the first. Yeah, thanks. I just, uh, I mean, I thought that question was a bit sort of <clears throat> um, reacting to some of the things I've said. So um, to, to come back on that, um, I think, first of all, on the food waste issue, I mean, I think the role of packaging in reducing food, page, food waste is there, but it can also be overstated. So I think there's a lot of other factors linked to that. Uh, the way the farm product is brought to the supermarkets, uh, local cultures, rules around the due date best to consume before, confusing people that you need to throw it away afterwards. Um, so there's a lot of things to be done around that. Certainly there's a role for packaging, but still there is a lot of ways in which the, the packaging itself can be reduced before you actually come into a conflict situation. But I want to add another thing to that, linked also to your point about the, the economy is in a slowdown and might take a while before it picks up, there's less demand, so is there really that much competition? Well, I mean, as, as a sort of economic forecast aside, um, <clears throat> I think you've all heard about the, you've seen the impacts of the biofuels, bioenergy policies the EU has. Um, there's a much bigger beast knocking at the door, which is called bioeconomy, the bio-based economy. And that's something that's some sort of almost inevitable process. If you run out of fossil fuels, you're going to move back to bio-based uh, resources. And that's going to increase the competition for a lot of the packaging materials massively. So I think there is a very strong imperative even for that reason alone to, to reduce it. If I can just say one thing on the uh, top 10, because that's sort of another thing we've been hearing a lot about. I mean, I was getting a bit nervous when irritant becomes a, 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 a factor for policymakers, asking people what the irritates is about. I think when you, when you look at these issues, you need to be really very fact-based, very clear. What exactly is it that's causing a certain uh, <clears throat> cost that can be, can be reduced without actually uh, not compromising achieving the objectives? But I think you need to be very clear about that. And if you, when you start talking about oh, how irritant is it that you need to do something, um, could become a very unpleasant discussion. So. Okay, and we certainly don't want unpleasant discussions. We want fat, matter of fact discussions, and that's what we've been doing all afternoon, I think. Harold Kep? Yeah, hello. My name is uh, Harold Kep. Uh, congratulations here to Europe, and I'm here on behalf of Brascam, which is a Brazilian producer, also with locations, production, uh, production places in, in Europe, in Germany. Uh, I have a question which concerns a specific product, uh, but it's also kind of an example and therefore I guess worth mentioning it here when we come to waste prevention. Obviously, Italy has uh, thought that a ban of plastic bags, of single-use plastic bags, is the best way uh, to prevent from waste and from negative aspects, littering. Uh, marine littering has been mentioned, especially in the public discussion, which was, which was a very vigorous one. And I know that now uh, also uh, um, Commissioner Potocznik mentioned it. There is a discussion also uh, about to tax ba bags or, or even uh, ban bags on a European level. And what comes into my mind is, I want, don't want to go into details, whether these kind of instruments for some products which might look in the first place as uh, not uh, good for the environment, but we all know that plastic bags, they have a function and they carry uh, things, they can be reused, they can be recycled like any other plastic uh, packaging. And uh, we have vigorous discussions also to ban other uh, packaging products like polystyrene, uh, tableware, or whatever. So is this a viable instrument or should you not stay uh, very much to the principle of uh, the essential requirements 
requirements and look at uh, uh, prevention and recycling targets in general? Or will the Commission and also countries or uh, NGOs ask uh, to pick up specific product groups in the packaging arena and ban them or tax them for whatever reason? Okay, thanks very much. And I think you were the first one this afternoon to pronounce the word ban, were you not? Had we heard the word ban before, Mr. Langendorf? Uh, not from me so far, I think. Um, um, plastic bags, I mean, again, the, the commissioner, I think, mentioned it uh, very, very briefly uh, in the context of littering. And, and uh, I personally believe that littering is, is a big problem. Marine littering certainly is. It has been um, mentioned in our green paper on, on plastic uh, waste, um, and it's no secret that the Commission has been discussing a possible legislative proposal on plastic bags for quite a long time, um, and we are all quite eager uh, to see what form it will finally take, this, this proposal. Um, and honestly, I don't know myself exactly, and if I knew, I wouldn't tell you now. We will have to wait, hopefully, not so long, and we will see. Um, the, the discussion has been going on a little bit about to what extent should plastic bags, should the problem of plastic bags, and we're not talking about all plastic bags, we're talking about lightweight plastic bags uh, that are basically uh, less frequently recycled and reused than, than more solid. Um, thicker plastic bags. So that's an important distinction already. Uh, but what is the best approach to tackle that, that problem? Uh, we have 100 billion plastic bags in the European Union consumed a year. And according to our data, some 8 to 10 billion of those uh, are littered in nature and end up in streams and seas and lakes. So there is a real, uh, there is a real problem. Should we tackle the problem uh, essentially uh, at member state level, uh, so giving member state a number of, of instruments to tackle the problem, or should there be an EU-wide uh, um, measure uh, of whatever nature? That has been part of the discussion, so the subsidiarity element in the discussions has been quite, has been quite important. Um, we are aware of the Italian uh, measures, and that has partly driven uh, the the process at at European at the European Commission. Member states have turned to us and said, "Well, this is a, a problem that should be dealt with at at the European level. We cannot leave uh, individual member states to do uh, uh, what they want. There should be some form of coordination." But what exact form the proposal, which uh, which we hope will come out still this year, what what exact form it will take, uh, is is something that uh, you will just have to uh, what you will have to see. Okay. Uh, it's obvious. Okay. No, 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 not without a microphone. Sorry. So, okay. Um, it, it is obvious that any uh, national measures will have to be in line with EU legislation, with the treaty provisions, uh, and that is something that we will make sure uh, will happen. Okay. Um, okay. We only have uh, six minutes left for this panel, and you had a, a remark that you could not not express immediately, very, very briefly. No, it's just more about the principle. If we uh, tackle now one product which is supposed to drive littering, you could also ask for what to do with uh, plastic bottles or with much, much of other packaging. And there you, you don't talk about bans or tax or whatever. And this is to me something, it's more a principle question. Okay, you've made your point and you've made it clear that it's a principle question. And we have two more questions on that side and that will have to conclude the panel discussion. But passing by uh, the chairman, Mr. Reynolds, uh, in the few minutes that we have left, uh, we, we'll take some extra time. Okay, we'll make it a little longer. Okay, there we go. Let's forget about uh, our supper. Yeah, um, here we go. <laughs> Um, my name is Roberto Ferrigno, I do represent Novamont. Novamont is an Italian company producing biodegradable compostable plastics. First of all, happy anniversary to Europe and thank you very much, Virginia, for inviting us today. Uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, about uh, um, the uh, essential requirements of the packaging directive. Some of the speakers already touched upon it, and uh, I was wondering how deep 
uh, the Commission is going to think about uh, uh, a better implementation of the essential requirements because at the moment uh, the implementation by member states uh, of this important feature of the packaging directive is not satisfactory at all. Second, Okay, let's have the first question then we'll come back to you for the second question. Not satisfactory implementation out there in the field. We've already discussed part of that, uh, Ms. Lando, the short answer to this. Well, the short answer is that indeed it's, it's something that we will be looking at, that industry itself, uh, for, for partly for the reasons I think that you mentioned, there is a cost factor, uh, so there is a drive to take the things, take essential requirements seriously. It's true that member states, what member states tell us, they find it difficult to monitor in force because the essential requirements as contained in the packaging directive are rather general. Uh, recyclability, reusability, it's, it's all rather general. How can member states uh, really uh, I I monitor and enforce that? They don't have staff, they don't have the expertise. At the same time, we know there is good practice in some member states. Others are working on some more uh, guidance. What is also clear is that some issues are not sufficiently or not adequately covered by essential requirements. Um, take the issue and something that came up at the uh, waste, uh, the plastic waste uh, conference. Biodegradability is an issue that is described in rather general terms, uh, but we all know that biodegradability uh, can mean different things to many different people. So that's an example where maybe we should be more specific about what biodegradable means, biodegradable in nature, biodegradable in industrial, uh, in industrial processes and so forth. Just one example. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, second question, very briefly, and the brief answer. The second question is packaging innovation. I would like to build on what Ms. Uh, Teresa Bresa said before, just to be more creative. And my question is to probably all of the people on the panel. Uh, don't you think that uh, the approach we've been uh, taking so far with the packaging directive is a bit obsolete? Would it be time to split the packaging directive in two? One measure dealing with uh, packaging waste and the other measure dealing with packaging innovation in terms of products. Thank you. Okay, and I can see Mr. Langendorf nodding carefully, and uh, let's interpret his nodding. We're certainly being creative here. Yes, Mr. Langendorf? Uh, uh, Mr. Langendorf is just writing down the interesting suggestions, and it may have been that while writing down he was also nodding, but uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's try uh, to get something out of yes. the other speakers first. Absolutely. Louis Lindenberg. Yes. When you look at the future from the position where you are, and your perspective is a global one, um, what do you see coming out? How do you, are you preparing for that future? I think, just to answer the, the question directly first, I think that they are not mutually exclusive of each other. They, they're interdependent. Um, and a lot of the innovation that we're focusing on these days is focused around helping recycling and recovery at the end of it. We must remember we designed packs with a functionality in place. So it's a consumer functionality, it's a, a, a product protection functionality, health and safety, all of those kind of things. And, it, and then we, we're trying to get it to go through these schemes. And some schemes are far more developed than other schemes. So I think both of them work together. Um, you, you, know, you, you could split it into two policies or you could have the same policy. Either. But effectively what we're trying to do is we're trying to extract as much value as we possibly can from, a, from the resource that's left over and use the minimal amount of inputs in the beginning. And you're using both levers to be able to do that. Okay, and I can see you nodding and I'm not going to ask what it means. You're in agreement on that one. Yes. Um, three more interventions. You were first, then you... Uh, okay, four more, and that would probably have to conclude. Okay. Sorry? Is there a QA and a afterwards? This is our Q&A. Just ask your question. Yes. Right. Um, my name is Thomas, Thomas Davrou. I'm Secretary General to, for PEFC Belgium, uh, the Sustainable Certification uh, Scheme for Forestry. And um, we've heard a lot of emphasis uh, this afternoon about the end-of-life um, phase of packaging, which, which is clearly very important, but um, resource efficiency in the life cycle perspective starts uh, obviously at the sustainable sourcing of the material. 
And therefore, um, I have a, a double question maybe for one or both of the, the industry representatives um, tonight. Um, the first one being that um, I'd be interested to, to hear you elaborate on your com company activities and objectives related to sustain sustainable sourcing, use of sustainability label labels and engagement in traceability schemes uh, through the packaging supply chain. Okay, that's the first question. Very briefly, sustainable sourcing, Louis Lindenberg. The Sabine Strannad. We've got various targets that we set up, but let's just talk about paper and board and, and its association with forestry. And then also, if we look at Unilever, uh, palm oil, and all the work that we've been doing there and that. So for us, the most important objective is to ensure that we stop or we help to stop any deforestation of, of natural resources and that. And one of the tools that we have available to help us with that is to use certification schemes and to work with external companies um, as, a, as, a, as an industry sector. I mean, just recently there was the uh, Tropical Forest Alliance Agreement that's just been signed off. Yesterday we heard that APP has made a big announcement now about their programs on, on deforestation. So, yeah, that, that's my short answer. We, we support schemes that will stop it. Um, and be able to monitor what is going on, a proper audited trail. Okay, uh, maybe your second question will be answered by Mrs. Renard, uh, unless you want to come in straight away. Okay, now I can only say, um, I ask, no? I wait for the second question. Okay, second question. <laughs> well, the second question is a bit more specific, um, okay. because <laughs> BFC is the certification system of choice for small and family forest owners. And uh, them and their family represent in Europe alone between four and five million consumers. So m my question is, um, I'd be interested to hear in what measure these consumers, uh, PFC certified responsible forest management practices are considered in your procurement policies, especially in light of uh, the recent Consumer Good for Goods Forum pulp paper and packaging guidelines. Which I think it's a sort of question, maybe um, in Parliament, they usually give it to the Minister some time ahead, so that the Minister can answer in the same conditions as the parliamentarian. So you're reading your question, so maybe... It, it was given some time. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. So, uh, let's go for the answer. I'll, I'll ask my question. Okay. Mrs. Stronach? Um, our procurement as well, the whole supply chain is running uh, this in a very close and transparent form. We have the major packaging and our packaging matrix is plastic and PET. So everything which is related to paper or paper-based packaging is a smaller portion. Uh, but we do have as well, um, I would not call it requirement, but we ask our suppliers to follow the industry best standards and implement and, and we, we use this as a practice. But as, again, so that's, that's the standard what we have implemented. Okay, you also had a question. There was another one over there. Well, my name is Tom Schneider. I'm the president of the World Packaging Organization. And this is not an intervention. I also want to compliment Mr. Langendorf. Uh, you deserve combat pay for being here today. <laughs> My question goes back to uh, a question first posed by Ms. De Leche uh, when you referred to SMEs. And our work around the world is mostly involved with, with developing nations, which could be called micro and small enterprises, I think, in one way. So how do we take all the good work that, that e European has done over the last 20 years and propagate this valuable information? to Africa, to Asia. Africa is six or 700 million people. By 2050, it should be about 1.9 billion people, according to the UN. So how, do we, how, how can you help us take that knowledge and the, and the work that's been done with the commission as well? How can we take that to these other countries? Because they'll have an opportunity to start at a higher level than you all had to start with. Let's ask Mr. Lindenberg. Your, your perspective is a global one. So your answer to this? I can tell you what we're doing within the businesses. I mean, we operate in uh, over 100 countries, have manufacturing sites, and we sell in about 192. Um, and our program that we've set up, the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, for everything from our sustainable sourcing practices through to our waste management, our eco plant efficiencies, and end of life scenarios, is pushed right through the whole globe. So. 
Uh, I've got Brazil, I've got Mexico, I've got Thailand, Indonesia, China, India, South Africa, Turkey. They're all big target countries. I spend my life in those countries driving programs the whole time, and so do a lot of my other counterparts. The thing is that this is quite a recent phenomenon, and, and, and we shouldn't be impatient about it. I mean, <laughs> a guy like me didn't exist in, in our businesses uh, five to ten years ago. It's, it's all new, and it's evolving, and we're learning, and we've made a lot of mistakes, but we, we get up and we take those mistakes, and we continue to build. The big problem that we do have is that no country is the same. Infrastructure is different, consumer habits are different, the legislation is different, everything is different. So it's not about rubber stamping one initiative from one country into another. You have to, and, and this is something I wanted to talk about, uh, I haven't had a chance here, but wh what you've got to do is you've got to map out an infrastructure. And you can't say, it's like targets. We can't say 75% target across Europe. I, d I don't agree with that because I don't think some countries have got the infrastructure to hit that versus other countries. I think what you've got to do is you've got to look at a country, you've got to map it out in great de detail, and then you devise a program to upskill that country. Some are starting with absolutely nothing. Some are starting in quite a good place. Thank you very much. We don't want to embarrass Mr. Langendorf because we know that he has a train to catch to go to Strasbourg to the European Parliament. Maybe a few more minutes uh, with a few more questions. There was one here. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, John Swift, as, as you heard earlier, a previous chair of European. And this, this um, I want to take us back to the essential requirements and particularly the suite of SEN standards, which was developed and, and harmonized to, with the purpose of demonstrating compliance um, against the essential requirements. Uh, Louis Lindenberg earlier on referred to the Global Packaging Protocol. I also had the pleasure and the honor to be part of the team developing that, that, that protocol. Um, and I think a key element of that is the references that are made all the way through that protocol to the SEN standards and indeed the, at the time the, the ISO standards uh, that, ma that match them were in the final stages of developing them. So you, you see those references to SEN and ISO standards all the way through that. And I think Louis made the, the value, valuable point that, that that is a document that exists, it's there in practical terms for, for use. Um, I would dearly love to see it more widely used, and I think we need to think to think really that we have the practical tool as as the packaging chain to actually be demonstrating the the compliance so my my direct question and apologies this is back to to uh, mr langendorf again is from our side we believe we have the practical tool is not the issue actually with the member states and a certain reluctance to really get on and have the, the implementation programs actually in the member states? I, I believe you will find the industry, the packaging chain as a whole, very willing to, to provide the demonstration of compliance. Okay, thank you very much. And that will have to be the final intervention from the floor, I'm afraid. We'll throw it back to the panel for final comments after what we've just heard. And, uh, we started off with you in the panel, so let me give you the final word in this uh, and start off with Mr. Lindeberg. After we, what we've just heard, a final comment uh, before we conclude this uh, discussion. Um. So I'll, I'll come back to what I was saying about the targets and about mapping and that. We are a company that has a very diverse portfolio of materials that we uh, put out into the marketplace. Um, so it's not as easy as, <laughs> as developing a spec for pet and that's a job done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we have a lot of materials. Now, when uh, I'm very involved uh, with, with a program in the UK at the moment, and the UK just recently announced new targets. And looking at trying to hit those targets over the next few years, we're really going to have to bring in a whole lot more materials than what we're currently collecting. So now it's not just about uh, bottles, but it's about bottles and tubs and trays and pots, 
and we may even need to look further than that just to be able to, to hit um, the targets. The infrastructure that we have in the UK, I would think, is pretty well developed. A lot of local authorities aren't harmonized in what they're collecting, but certainly the infrastructure is there and there. Now, if we're struggling, then I, 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 you know, to get to a point where we think we're going to hit the targets, then um, I think in, in some of our other European countries, it might be even more difficult. And therefore, a nuanced type system might be what we want to look at and setting our very developed countries uh, some specific targets and the countries that aren't as well developed yet to set them targets that we, with, with an objective of eventually getting everybody equal. Okay. Um, so that's my if opinion. walking out of this session in a few minutes you bumped into one of these terrible television crews with a television journalist asking you to sum it all up in a TV soundbite, 14 seconds, what would you say, Mr. Lindenberg? I think everything that, we, that we've heard today, there's, there's been a yes. lot of repetition about common definition. Okay. And I think harmonization for me is the key word out of Harmonization, all of harmonization. Mrs. Stranat, in 14 seconds. Okay. Europe and has proven to be really a good example to get cross-sectoral industry together and to produce and support that we implement our, that we implement the legislation and we take over our responsibility. And okay, Mrs. De Leche, I know you don't want to speak about specific member states, but tell us one word about Milan 2015. Exactly. Thank 14 you. seconds. Thank 14 you very seconds. Much. Yes. So the theme of our expo in 2015 is uh, feeding the planet energy for life. And as I said, I believe that the packaging industry has a lot to say about uh, improving food sustainability. And I'm pretty sure that. European will be there. The European Commission already said that they will be there. So I'm just hoping that all of you will contribute to the, the success of the event. Excellent. Peter de Pers, 14 seconds, starting now. Yes. Okay. I would say let, let, let's take um, past achievements as a reason to, to, to go further, to, uh, to aim high. And I would also want to, to, to thank European for this, uh, this opportunity. I think this is going to be a start of a very long and interesting discussion and dialogue, so thank you very much. Yes, and also 14 uh, seconds for a loving mother to a 20-year-old healthy adult. What do you wish the adult? Well, you've said it all, a healthy, good life and lots more prosperous things to be done in the next 20 years. Okay, and uh, we've had, of course, Mr. Uh, Hollander doing so much hard work that he probably doesn't need his final 14 seconds, or does he? I'm happy to take 14 seconds. Um, I think the commissioner, uh, uh, there's a quote in the, uh, in the brochure saying that uh, a lot has been achieved, and he also said in the video message, a lot has been achieved. I think that's undeniable um, in terms of recycling, but also the other aspects of the packaging. But we all know that there are lots of other things that we can be doing. We feel that there is a lot of common ground on many of these issues, and of course we need the support of industry, including the packaging industry, to move these things forward. If there are other ideas that go beyond what's currently in the directive, and uh, Teresa Press has mentioned some of it, uh, uh, Roberto Ferrigno mentioned some of these things, then of course uh, talk to us and see what it is that we can do in more innovative ways. Uh, but yes, uh, targets are important and will be part of our review. Thank you very much. And now a final thought from the Managing Director of European, Mrs. Virginia Janssens. views and questions of this evening, one could conclude that Europe has just secured its other mandate for another 20 years. Um, with the introduction of the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive about 20 years ago, Europe was set up to present the balanced views of the packaging supply chain on topics related to packaging and the environment. Now, some refer to Europe as the United Nations of the packaging industry which is seen in a prudent light, I tend to agree with, you may recognize the following similarities based on the statutes of the UN, which I freely applied in a European context. One, maintain packaging peace and security of the packaging supply chain. Two, 
develop friendly relations among members and other stakeholders based on respect for the principle of equal rights. Three, achieve cooperation in solving problems of an environmental character and in promoting and encouraging respect for packaging and for fundamental freedoms for all packaging materials. And four, the organization is based on the principle of the sovereign equality of all its members. Where we differ from the UN, among other things, is our active contribution to the EU policy and regulatory process. Europe and welcomes the current EU waste legislation review, and in particular the review of the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive, which we still consider the appropriate and effective framework to drive and accelerate efforts towards greater resource efficiency for packaging and packaging waste. It is therefore encouraging to hear the Commission's current considerations and focus areas. Has the Commission left? Yeah, Julius has left. <laughs> Um, so, for instance, Europe and also supports, and, and Julius has raised it uh, during the panel discussion too, the, the full implementation and enforcement of EU waste legislation in all member states. This will, among others, help close the existing gaps between member states. Two, we also support the focus to, to collect more household packaging waste for recycling or recovery. Europe and therefore suggests specific requirements in the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive to boost post-consumer packaging collection. Three, we also support harmonization of certain definitions in the Waste Framework Directive and the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive and to harmonize the reporting and the calculation uh, of recycling and recovery in the member states. We're also there to support, or Europe and also supports a gradual phase-out of landfill provided that ad adequate recycling or recovery infrastructure is in place in the member states where it is needed. And last but not least, uh, European supports also the to improve the effectiveness and transparency of EPR schemes for packaging waste, which are key to drive prevention and to meet current and future packaging waste targets. Now, in tackling our shared challenges and objectives in meeting recycling and recovery targets, industry and municipalities and citizens all have an interlinked responsibility based on what each, each stakeholder can control and can account for. EPR schemes are considered a key tool for the obliged industry to help achieve packaging, recycling and recovery targets. They incorporate industry's part of, the of their responsibility, which is the end-of-life management of the packaging that companies put on the market. So this is the part that the obliged industry can control and is accountable for as part of the EPR principle. However, there is currently no legal framework that ensures a level playing field for the operation of competing EPR schemes. Therefore, some corrective legal measures are needed in the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive, such as a harmonized definition of EPR, minimum requirements for EPR schemes that ensure transparency and effectiveness, along with clearly assigned roles and responsibilities for member states and economic operators. Now, these measures should lead to more transparency, traceability, cost effectiveness, and hence a better performance of EPR schemes which will drive national, and, uh, national rec recycling and recovery rates. Now, European members are not against higher recycling targets. However, we should not forget the current and medium-term economic and environmental realities of recycling packaging materials. High levels of recycling are not necessarily environmentally beneficial in all cases or make sense economically. The priority should be to optimize rather than maximize recycling. Europe and therefore supports the Commission's impact assessment, as Julian also mentioned today, if indeed all member states are ready for those for higher targets and against which timelines. In a nutshell, Europe and calls on the Commission to propose realistic and achievable targets in the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive, taking into account the infrastructures, current performances in the member states, economic and technical feasibility in the member states. And one option is to explore the possibility of setting different targets for different groups in the member states according to performances. 
There is one last but overarching point I would like to stress, and Roberto, don't take it personal, but Europe and strongly supports the packaging and packaging waste directive as it is. A separate EU regulatory approach is essential in order to address packaging specific requirements in terms of volume, consumer visibility, recycling value and market structure. It guarantees the free movement of packaged products and ensures regulatory security and predictability for companies investing in the packaging, recycling and recovery value change, chains. And as mentioned earlier, it is also the right framework for driving recovery and recycling of all packaging waste and ensures that the legal obligation to collect packaging for recycling and recovery continues. The packaging targets should therefore not be subsumed in the broader waste framework directive. European members remain committed to improve the environmental performances of their packaging and packaged products throughout the life cycle, starting from sourcing, production, distribution, retail, the consumer phase to the end of life phase. While the current focus of today and, and uh, today's debate uh, is on the end of life, let us keep in mind that packaging needs to be fit for purpose for all those stages. <laughs> packaging helps reduce product and food waste, protects resources across the value chain, brings food and products in a safe manner to the consumer, and is increasingly resource efficient in its end-of-life phase. So for our industry to continue on this resource efficiency path, it will be important that the EU continues to recognize and enable the positive value of packaging to society and its positive contribution towards resource efficiency, and this through transparent, effective and proportionate legislation for packaging and packaging waste. And this will create more opportunities for businesses to grow, innovate and create more jobs thanks to their environmental commitments and sustainable practices. The Commission has put effective waste management as the central theme for next year, and Europe and its members look forward to further contribute to the debate and this important review process. Packaging in the environment is not just a simple tagline. After 20 years, it is certainly no longer at the beginning of a beautiful friendship, but rather ensures a continuous progress towards a sustainable friendship and society. Now, I would like to close by thanking you all for your participation. And my special thanks goes to those who helped make this anniversary a reality. And that is, of course, the panelists for their experts' insights, our skillful moderator, Alex Puisson, the team of Burst and Marsteller for their very good support throughout this anniversary's life cycle, FOSS Plus for offering to display its exhibition on packaging and the evolution through, it, through the ages. Please have a look. And then there's the uh, European members, of course, the European Executive Committee for their support. And a special thanks goes to Martin Reynolds, uh, European Chairman, for his continued valuable advice, support, and true commitment to European. Thank you, Martin. And then, of course, there's the rest of, the, of my team. Francois, Dara, Dana, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, and ladies and gentlemen, now it, it is my pleasure to invite you all for uh, a toast to European's anniversary uh, next door for the, to the cocktail reception. Thank you and have a good evening.